Uh, first of all, thank you to Dr. Itula and thank you to the IPC overall for inviting me to speak and, uh, uh, and have this platform. I won't take up too much time. Um, I do have a short PowerPoint, but as, as I say, it is quite short, so, so don't worry too much. Um, but I just wanted to introduce to you the Institute for Public Policy Research. Um, obviously, we've already heard quite a lot about you talking about yourselves as um, a possible future government of Namibia. To do that, you have to develop your policies, uh, you have to have a clear platform and a clear manifesto and so on. So um, the kind of work we do will definitely um, overlap in, in some respects with you, your party and also with other parties, of course, as uh, you develop your and research your serious uh, policy alternatives to uh, what might be happening at the moment in the country. Um, so if we move the slide on, I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about the IPPR. Um, we just passed our 20th anniversary. We were founded in 2001. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization, so we see ourselves as a civil society organization uh, as well as a think tank. Um, and uh, we have our essential mission is to deliver independent, analytical, critical yet constructive research on social, political and ec economic issues that affect development in Namibia. So we, we have a pretty broad mandate. Um, I'd like to say we, we fulfill it completely, but we're just uh, too small an organization to be, fulfill all aspects of that. But we, we do uh, a lot of work. Um, some of you might follow us, uh, you know, see our, our mentions in the media or follow us on social media or look at our website every so often. And you'll know that we are a pretty regular and pretty constant part of uh, public debate and public dialogue in the country. Um, so we believe that development is best promoted through free and critical debate informed by quality research. And so the key element about our research is not that we just write nice papers or nice publications and we put them on a shelf and we forget about them. We're, we're trying very much to engage the public, to engage citizens, uh, in the hope that uh, we can raise the quality of public debate in Namibia and to provide encounters and opportunities uh, for learning and for development. And uh, that, that's a key, key part. So we're not, we don't see ourselves really as an academic institution, although we like to apply. Okay, I'm not speaking loud enough. I'm afraid Dr. Tula's set a very high standard, so. Uh, <laughs> I need to raise my volume or get closer to the mic. Um, so as I say, we're, we're not just uh, um, an academic uh, institution that uh, puts away its research on uh, library shelves and forgets about it. We want to engage uh, citizens, the public in general, to try and uh, think about policy issues, develop better policies, develop, develop alternative ideas, develop suggestions for legal reform, and. Uh, and to really uh, have an impact. Uh, so that, that's a crucial element to the work that we do. Um, the other thing that we need to stress um, is that we are an independent organization. So we're independent of government, political parties, commercial interests, trade unions, and other interest groups. Um, so we pride ourselves on our independence. So that means we, we, can't have a, we don't have formal relationships with political parties. But we're happy, of course, and um, keen to also to engage in dialogue uh, and talk about issues with whoever, whether a politician, whether in political parties or not. Um, if you can move the slide on. Um, so we um, are the only Namibian uh, think tank that's rated in the top 50 um, think tanks in Africa by the University of Pennsylvania. And the University of Pennsylvania is the only institution that does a global ranking of, of think tanks um, and uh, we're also rated as 54th in the world in terms of integrity policies and procedures uh, by the same university and that's very important because as I'm sure you know as a political party that is often vocal on transparency and accountability and corruption issues 
that you can't really criticise on those issues unless you have your own house in order. So uh, as, a, as a civil society organisation, we have to make sure that we are properly managed, properly run, that our financials are properly uh, managed and also that we are transparent, that we publish. Uh, well, I think as far as I know, we're the only uh, Namibian CSO that publishes its, uh, its audited accounts, full audited accounts on its website. Um, so we are dependent on grant aid. Unfortunately, you know, I can't say that we get a lot of support from Namibian organizations or businesses. So um, we're still with the tradition, if you like, uh, donors. Uh, at the moment, it's the Embassy of Finland, Hans Seidel Foundation, the US Embassy, and, and a few other smaller uh, organizations and uh, institutions that are supporting our work. Um, and uh, our funding varies a lot. I mean, sometimes we, the, the figure that's there, which is nearly five million Namibian dollars in a year, is, is a good year. Um, but sometimes it's, it's tougher. Um, the thing that the president always complains about, our upper middle income status in, in the eyes of the World Bank, is a, is a problem for us as well, because many donors, uh, as I say, the traditional donors, are not really thinking about Namibia anymore because they see that and they, they think we're doing fine. And of course it's not a nuanced uh, take on what's happening in Namibia um, uh, with the different socio-economic problems we have, the level of poverty, the amount of inequality and so on. Um, but we also do suffer from that. Um, and then we are part of the global community of researchers working particularly on governance issues. So things like budget transparency with the International Budget Partnership, uh, economic competitiveness with the World Economic Forum, and so on. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So this tells you uh, what we're up to at the moment, and this is uh, where our activities and our publications might be uh, useful for you. Um, we do monitor the work of Parliament. We publish uh, papers on bills and issues that are coming up in Parliament. In, in the past, for example, we, wrote, we published on NEF, which is an issue that's already been mentioned today. Um, we are um, doing regular bulletins on what's happening in Parliament. Just yesterday, we published a bulletin that is criticizing the National Assembly because of the very poor um, way that they organize their assets and interest register. You know that the MPs are supposed to declare their assets and interests on a yearly basis. It hardly ever happens and uh, actually the whole system is in disarray. Um, and then a new project we just launched this year is based really around anti-corruption work. It's called Integrity Namibia. And the, the ultimate aim there is to build a national uh, alliance against corruption and to promote integrity in the country and um, this is something that you'll hear a lot more about in the next few months as we roll out various activities but as, as I think you know you have alluded to already um, corruption is at a crisis point in Namibia and if we don't take action now as a society it will overwhelm us um, in the next few years it might already be getting to that stage uh, but uh, we have to take action now. Of course, this is not an activity that's maybe in the comfort zone of a think tank or a research body, but we feel that we have to take an extra step on corruption. We've done a lot of work, research work on governance issues, and uh, we feel that uh, while we, that has had some impact, we need to do more work uh, generally, more broadly in society to tackle corruption. Um, we have very specialist projects like Procurement Tracker, which is looking at the application of the public procurement law in Namibia. And of course, we know that's a huge risk area for corruption, and there are already many examples of things going wrong in that area. We believe in openness and transparency. We want to see the government publishing a lot more information about how it spends its money in the budget, and also. Um, publish it in inaccessible ways so that people can actually understand it and uh, see what the priorities are of government in terms of the way they spend uh, taxpayers' money. Um, we look at specialist issues, uh, issues that might be ones of the future like cyber security, 
and how they impact on human how that impacts on human rights. Um, we're concerned also, as part of our look at corruption, that we also minimise waste. Um, we have such a tight fiscal situation in Namibia at the moment. Um, government is uh, struggling to raise the revenue it needs um, to spend on uh, important priorities, and uh, therefore we should we can't really afford to waste money. And yet we have a lot of public enterprises that are very poorly governed very badly managed, they don't behave or perform in accountable ways, they don't publish annual reports, they don't uh, publish uh, their accounts. So we're trying to monitor that through an annual governance ranking of the public enterprises. <clears throat> we do economic research. Um, I'm not an economist, I'm more of a governance expert, but of course, understanding economics, um, doing research in this area is absolutely crucial absolutely crucial for any political party. Um, and then, of course, we look at the issues that are coming up, the ones that are um, facing Namibia or the ones that are being raised at the moment on, in specialist one-off papers. Um, we're looking next week, we'll have a paper launched on how Namibia's tourism industry can bounce back from the COVID period. Um, we're looking at a really important issue, which is how we can start to move on from fish rot in terms of uh, allocating fishing quotas in a far more responsible, um, accountable and transparent way than happened in the past. And we've also started to look at the green hydrogen. We don't do scientific research, so we're not looking really at the technical aspects. The green hydrogen, as the President said, is the biggest tender in Namibian history. So we were rather shocked when we looked into it and found that actually it didn't follow the public procurement law, which is set down to do the tenders. So uh, they found another very strange mechanism for uh, proceeding in terms of uh, appointing a preferred bidder for that project. Uh, that's recently published work that's available on our website. So we tend to focus on those kind of key governance issues. Um, do we have an impact? We can move on to the next slide. You know, are we, is all, all this just talk and we don't have any, have, have any impact? Um, well, I think we can show some track record of having an impact. Um, we certainly raise a lot of public awareness. We have more than 200 media articles and reports per year that uh, cite and use the IPPR as, as a key source. Um, as I say here, government takes notice sometimes. Um, so they did actually um, adopt a public procurement law in uh, 2015 that was largely based on recommendations that we'd made, although we weren't the only people who were putting in those recommendations. Uh, we did get a whistleblower protection law passed um, based again on quite a lot of research that we'd done in 2017. Uh, but as I sometimes say, with, with this government it's often a case of one step forward then almost immediately one step backwards. Um, and uh, of course, the whistleblower protection law has never been operationalized. So in effect, it lies there, but it's, it has no, it does not offer any protection to anybody who comes forward with corruption, uh, evidence of corruption. And I noticed yesterday the Ministry of Lands put out a press release calling on people to deliver their evidence to the Ministry of Corruption as long as they gave their name and handed it all in in detail to, to a certain office. Well, you know, I mean, do people really who have corruption and might, might be worried about retaliation and retribution for what they're saying want to use that kind of system? You have to have a better way of, of being able to protect people who are genuinely reporting corruption. Um, <clears throat> we have a, an active social media presence, so we, I think we're, I'm fairly safe in saying that we are the most active civil society organization on, on Facebook and Twitter and we're also on Instagram. And that, of course, is a crucial way to, meet, to reach young people. We don't have the resources um, to go out to every region in the country. I'm sure you as a new political party might also have that problem sometimes. So it's, it's really crucial to utilize uh, social media to reach young people. Um, all our um, publications are free of charge, apart from one publication, which is a huge book, a 700-page book called The Guide to the Namibian Economy, which we do charge for, and that's one way that we can raise a little bit of money to pay our rent and to pay our Wi-Fi costs and so on. Um, and then, of course, you know, do we get involved in campaign work? 
almost inevitably, you know, the kind of work we do does draw us into advocacy. But in terms of doing full-on sort of campaigning work, like a campaign organization, that's not really the, 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 the first task of a think tank. So what we have done in the past is we've taken up constitutional issues. So when, in 2014, uh, the ruling party decided to change the constitution to enlarge the National Assembly and the National Council without any public consultations taking place, um, we did object and campaign against that and, and called for public consultations. We've actively campaigned for the access to information law because that's a law that will benefit all of us, but it's also a self-interest for researchers because obviously we can't uh, do proper research unless we can get access to data, statistics, official information, which is such a, a huge problem for this government to release uh, basic data. Uh, we're not talking about controversial stuff or anything related to security, but just basic information, basic data, basic reports. And then something I just wanted to alert you to, because not many people know this, but we have a research act in place, uh, in operation, which we believe is unconstitutional. Together with the Legal Assistance Centre and the Namibian newspaper, we took the Ministry of Higher Education to court more than five or six years ago. I'm afraid it's one of those many court cases that's bogged down in endless delays, um, but we are challenging that law on the basis of being unconstitutional. Essentially what would happen is that we would have to register every single research project we do with the National Research Commission and get their, their permission to go ahead. And we'd have to prove all kinds of things, including it being beneficial for, for Namibia and so on, which, you know, can be interpreted in different ways. So uh, we feel it's um, against Chapter 3 of the Constitution and, 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 and uh, a whole number of uh, fundamental freedoms and rights that we have. So uh, that, that, on, that is ongoing. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't follow the law. Um, some people do. Um, the next slide, um, I'm coming to the end now, but um, the, the way that we organize the IPPR, we're not well resourced and we're not well funded, so we have to do more with less, if you like. So um, we, I'm the only full-time employee of the Institute. We have a part-time accountant and a part-time administrator running our sort of offices, office and, and finances. And then we have about depending on the number of projects, between 10 and 15 researchers uh, working as research associates, and they're based on a project, they're employed on a project basis. This is a picture from our 20th celebration towards the end of last year. Um, so I hope that the message of that picture really is that, um, and I think it's the same that applies to political parties, that if you want to make progress, if you want to develop, you have to have diversity, uh, amongst your membership, amongst your staff, your employees. Um, in Namibia, because we are such a young population, over half um, the population is under 21. So the demographics tell you that, you know, as, as a political organization or any organization that wants to be relevant in Namibia, you have to have young people at the heart of it. Um, so we try to use, uh, utilize as much as possible young Namibians, many of them graduates of UNAM and NUST, uh, in our research team as well. So um, looking to the future, you know, you have to build on those, uh, those cornerstones and those principles. Um, and then just to uh, come to an end, the next slide. One of the things that really frustrates me about Namibia is that, you know, 30 years on since independence, uh, some things have been achieved and some progress has been made, undoubtedly. But we could be so much further on than we are. And I'm sure, obviously, opposition parties feel that way too, because that's why you're, you're in the opposition. And um, really, um, we, we could have been um, an exemplar, a role model, uh, on many issues for Africa and, uh, and, and for the world. I don't think we should hold our ambitions back. And uh, uh, at the moment, um, we're not doing that. And that's, I think, as I say, that there's sort of three C's, or almost three C's, were corruption, complacency, and lack of commitment. So um, increasingly, corruption is starting to take over our society. 
complacency is very closely linked to that because that allows corruption to take place and uh, al allows the corrupt to act with impunity. Um, and then um, a lack of commitment, which I could have also said political will. So we're brilliant at speeches. We have many fine policies that are well articulated. But getting them into action, making the, the rhetoric actually happen into a reality seems to be you know, almost impossible. Um, and yet the people go on making the same speeches, talking about zero tolerance for corruption. There's no evidence that we have zero tolerance for corruption. So um, I still am positive and hopeful, and I do believe that uh, you know, as a society as a whole, we, we can still make significant strides, make Namibia into a role model for Africa, and really make people look to us and say, you know, this is a, this is a place that has actually um, you know, got to grips with the challenges and is, is making real progress. When I say corruption, one of the things I'm really worried about for the future is the discovery of the oil. Because we, we really have to start now to make sure that we do not become Nigeria. We do, we do not become Equatorial Guinea in the way that we, view, we use proceeds from these natural resources. And um, that's a challenge for us. It's also a challenge for you in terms of how you develop your governance policies because we're starting research now on how we can change our laws and policies but also ho hopefully develop the political will to really make sure that Namibia does not fall into those traps that so many countries have done already and that we are actually an exemplar, a role model on the way that we handle our oil uh, income, which, you know, um, despite the energy transition that's taking place, um, from everything I'm hearing about the offshore fines, uh, they are significant and they will bring, probably in five or six years, significant amounts of money into government's coffers. Uh, and of course we have to be in a position by then to make sure that money is used for the best possible things, is used for socio-economic progress and is not siphoned off to the corrupt and you know we have fish rot to know that that, ha that does happen and has happened already. Um, so that, that's a, a very, we can finish and that's a very quick message really but um, you know I would, I would just say um, maybe two things. Uh, to be a successful political party, whoever you are, you have to have a national reach. And I know that um, uh, one party, opposition party, has been criticised this week because they, they do appear from the outside to be very regionally based. And um, as far as I can remember from the uh, 2020 local and regional results for the um, IPC, that you, uh, for a new party, uh, no, did demonstrate that you have... Uh, you can't be said to just operate in one or two regions. You have a, a, a broader reach. I would encourage you to develop that because that's a key to any successful party in the future. And then the second part, which is just, you know, we're a policy think tank. If you're going to present yourselves as a, an alternative government, as a, as a government in waiting, you have to start doing a lot of work on your policies. You have to do research. You have to maybe utilize us if you find us useful or anybody else, uh, research that's been done by other academics to make sure that you have a really strong policy platform that demonstrates not just a wish list of what you want to happen, but a realistic list of what you could do if you were in government. And that actually means doing things like costing, costing the, the, result, the changes that, and the policies that you want to make and want to introduce so that you can present yourselves as, as, a, as a government in waiting, not just another small-time opposition party who you know, shouts from the opposition benches. Um, so so that, that's just my last message, and uh, I I'm, I'm, uh, obviously uh, have to remain politically neutral, but um, pleased to be here and uh, look forward to you, you know, developing as a party and making a significant contribution uh, in Namibia in the future. Thanks very much.